Today we're going to answer more viewer questions, so let's jump right into it. Our next question comes from Bill Ferris, and it's been upvoted nine times. And Bill asks, what are your initial thoughts on the Pleasureway on tour vans? I think they're a great addition to the Pleasureway lineup. I think they make a lot of sense from a business standpoint for Pleasureway because they have the supply constraints for the Sprinter vans and two of their top selling models, the Ascent and the Plateau, are affected by the supply constraint from Mercedes on the Sprinter van. So it makes a lot of sense for them to introduce the Entours. I think from a consu for consumers, I think it's nice to have gas variants of those two very popular models and also to have maybe, hopefully, you know, a lesser cost version of those high quality uh, models as well. The flip side to that is, and maybe this is unfair of me, but I don't know if I would have called them new models uh, rather than just calling them gas variants of the current models because they're the exact same, pretty much the exact same layout as the Ascent and the Plateau. So why not just say it's the Ascent and Plateau available? Kind of this is the way they do it on many manufacturers do it in Europe. It's like available on this chassis or this chassis, right? So it's the same layout. Who cares, but it would have simplified their product lineup a little bit so they wouldn't have a, now just more models. Because I think when you introduce a model, in my book, when you introduce a new model, it needs to be something more than just switching out the chassis. That's my opinion. Like, it'd be great like if Pleasureway came out with a model that had a front lounge. They don't have a front lounge layout, right? Everything is pretty much a rear lounge layout. So to say, oh, we have a new model, it's a front lounge layout, that makes a lot of sense to me. So that's just a little nitpick for me. Like I would, I think, um, I just would have preferred these just to be gas variants of the current models. And then, you know, just, I would, I would I've said this to Dean, the CEO, uh, and so, you know, I'll share it with you. I understand why Pleasure, they're hyper-focused. They're, it's the reason why they've been around for so long. They, they know how to be really vigilant on not getting distracted. And so, uh, they resist, uh, they're very conservative and they resist a lot of change, but I do really wish that they would come out with new quote models, like a new model, like, uh, like the Tofino was a new model and it was real, it's really exciting, right? I mean, it addresses a new market. It's a pop top camper van. Uh, the price point's great. Um, it's, you know, for more of the outdoor adventurous as well as kind of the younger buyer. To me, that's a new model. I really wish really wish that Pleasureway would come out with a front lounge variant like the Bolt and, and like the Heimer Active, uh, the Solus, which we're going to talk about here because there's a user question about that, um, which is a pop top which the, with the front lounge layout. This is my opportunity to say, I like the Entours. Why wouldn't I like the Entours? I do wish that Pleasureway would have uh, a new model come out, an actual new model come out that would be a new, a, compl a completely new floor plan. Uh, but the, as far as the Entours are concerned, I, I like them. I love them. I can't wait to get into them to review them. Uh, and share that all with you. So that's my thinking on the on tours. Chase Olson asks, upvoted nine times as well. Chase asks, I love your little, uh, your, your little uh, icon there for your, your avatar for yourself. Uh, what is your favorite class B model for full-time living with two people? Oh, okay, this is one of those questions that I dread. So there is no one size fits all. Okay, so uh, that's why there's so many different RV models out there, manufacturers and products available for you is because there's no one size fits all. Everyone has different needs and different expectations, different tolerances for how much you want to pay for quality levels. That's why we have a wide variety of products. Now I will say for full-time living in a class B, uh, there's a couple basic things I think that you need to look for. Um, I think you need to look for something that is well built. Living full time out of a, any RV, but living full time out of a class B um, puts a lot of wear and tear on the coach part of the RV. And so in my book, you need something that is, that is well built. Okay, so go in there, just make sure that things are solid. You know, things aren't, you know, you're not seeing things fall apart or lights fall out of the ceiling or doors off their hinges. That's not gonna bode well for you later if two, two of you are living out of it full time. That's not gonna build well. So you need something well built. Um, you also need something that is ergonomically, when you're inside of it, set up for two people. Some layouts are not suited for two people. They're just not. So I'm thinking in particular of the Axion. The Axion, just ideally set up for one person. 
it just had a great layout for one person. It was a short little, cute little thing. Um, the bed was set up for, it was a size for one person, but it was not, it was not ideal for two people. So you need to make sure you have maneuverability inside that two people can be in there comfortably. The beds are a good size for two people. You need to make sure that um, ideally you have two living spaces because there's two of you in there. Why is that important? If one of you sleeping in in the morning, what's the other one of you going to do? You, when you get up, you have your cup of coffee and you're getting on the internet, you probably want to have a second lounge or something like that, right? So I'm not saying what the exact layout should be, but you should be looking at livability, ergonomics. Full-time living, it's, hard, it's really hard to do out of a Class B. I don't know if I could do it, it's, even by myself, but it's really hard to do out of a Class B. I mean, the, um, the Russos do it, uh, but you, and you should turn in, tune into their channel if this is something that you're interested in doing. We're the Russos. Um, they've successfully done it. They've been doing it for a number of years. In fact, they're downsizing. They started off in a Class A, and then they went down to a Class B, uh, uh, Heimer Active 2.0, and uh, they, they wanted to go even smaller than that. So it can be done. You're gonna have to, apart from the RV itself, I mean, you're gonna have to make a lot of sacrifices. You're gonna have to do the, the whole, you're gonna have to minimize your life and really figure out what are the things that are absolutely necessary that you can live with. And you're gonna part with 90% of the stuff that's in your life. You're gonna either sell it or put it into storage. And the other thing is, if there's two of you, you're gonna have to really make sure your relationship is strong. Uh, the Russos talk about that. You're in a really enclosed, confined space. You're gonna have to make sure your communication's good and open, uh, because you know, in a house and a stick and bricks like this, you know, if there's a conflict, I can go up to another room. I can go someplace in the in the in the house or something like that. But when you're in a 70 square foot area, that's a lot different. It puts a lot of stress on your relationship. So, I don't have a favorite Class B model. Well, I would say it's probably gonna be something like the active layout or like the bolt layout, which has a, a permanent front lounge, large enough, not, not just a small one, but large enough where you can um, do some work, eat, sit down, have your breakfast while the other person's in the back um, still sleeping or doing their thing. So something that has two living, two living areas like that. Uh, as far as the front, which one in my book, the front lounge layout, I, I don't have a preference for my favorite one of those, but it would be something that has two living spaces like that. Next question comes from Fly Shacker or Fly's Hacker. I don't know how you pronounce it. And upvoted by nine people as well. Fly's Hacker says, Neil, how practical is it to take a stock camper van? This is one you could buy off a dealer's lot and then take it to a custom shop to make modifications. So as an example, if they wanna take the Coachman Gallery at 24A, that's the one that has a permanent bed in the back with a, the lithium upgrade from Xantrex, but, they want the toilet and a macerator with black tank removed, and they want it replaced with a compositing toilet. Is that a practical idea? Or would removal of a black tank give more room for a larger freshwater tank or increased storage? And, or would I be better off of just leaving it as they are? I've never had this question asked of me, and you know, I, I don't know. Here's some, here's some of the things that pop up, you know, you can do anything you want. If you've got the money, you can do anything that you want. I don't know if it's more economical for you at that point to just build out a custom van from the ground up to meet your needs. Um, because you're gonna start off, let's say with the Galleria. Now, well, this is with the lithium upgrade. All right, I don't know, 115, I don't know, something like that. Thousand on it, maybe 120,000. So you're already starting at that base. Keep in mind, you're paying for, when you buy something, off a lot like that. You're already paying for all the all the R&D and all the design that they put into it. So you're talking about kind of ripping stuff out. You're going to have to find someone that's going to be good at doing that and willing to do that. Um, you're going to void your warranty when you do that, just so you're aware. So you're going to void your warranty. But then there's the, uh, kind of the, just the, I guess, logistical issues of that. So you know, when you rip out like a black tank, it's not just pulling the tank out. You have all the plumbing lines and things like that. If you had a macerator, there's electrical lines. All that's got to be dealt with and taken care of. And then uh, that could mean that you have to rip up the flooring if the water lines are internal. And I can't remember off the top of my head if the water lines are, I don't think they are on the Galleria, but let's say it's a different model where all the water lines are internal. That's going to mean ripping up all the floorings. So that's really costly at that point. I mean, at that point, you're almost doing a teardown of the entire interior because you got to take the cabinets out to get to the flooring. So at that point, it's, it's, 
it doesn't make a lot of sense to me from a cost perspective. You may as well just use that $120,000 as a base for then doing a custom van build uh, with one of these shops and, and get it off, get, get it the way that you want, or just buy the van like the gallery of 24A and just live with it. So, you know, as I talk through it, I, do, I just don't think it's that practical um, from an economic standpoint to start from a, a stock model like that and rip it all out and try to reconfigure it. I think you're just better off with working with one of these companies like Outside Van or, or Advanced RV or something like that. You're better off working with them on just building a custom van that is going to meet your needs from day one. This has been uploaded seven times. Michael Hansen asks, are the new Thor B vans, these are the sequences, which I did a review of recently, um, actually built by them or are they rebadged Heimers from Germany? So the reason why um, Michael's asking this question is uh, Thor last year bought out Heimer of Germany. Uh, so the, the master company Heimer integrated them into Thor. Michael Hansen's asking, well, when they did that in Europe, uh, made uh, vans built on the Ducato chassis. The Ducato in Europe is the same as the Promaster. So I believe, Michael, your question is, did they just take those models that are currently still being sold, Heimer is selling in, in Europe, and then just kind of rebadge them and rebrand them here for the North American market? I believe the answer to that question is no. And the reason why I believe it's no is because before the actual acquisition of Heimer, the sequence, a prototype of the sequence was shown before they had acquired Heimer. They had already been working on this. And, they had, and so I believe, to answer your question succinctly, I believe that the new Thor sequence vans are not rebadged Heimers. I believe they are built in-house by Thor. And it's kind of exciting because Thor now is the largest RV manufacturer in the world with the acquisition of Heimer. Thor themselves have never entered the B market. So the sequence is their first attempt at entering the very lucrative B market, and they're going head to head with Winnebago. And it's no surprise that the sequence uh, BL and the sequence KL are exact layouts of the Winnebago Travado uh, KL and BL. And so I don't think they call them KL and BL on the, on the sequence. But in any case, it's no, it's no surprise that they are a, a nearly exact floor plan layouts as the Winnebago models, because those are the top selling bees here in North America. So I think it's great personally, um, because more competition just means uh, it's just better for us as consumers. Right, we're gonna see more competition is gonna end up with uh, more innovation, better products, lower prices for us as consumers. But yeah, the, the, the Thor sequences, yeah, I believe those were all designed in-house by Thor. All right, next question is from Teresa McPherson. I've voted seven times. So Teresa asks, um, do you know if there is a way to make, make an HOA, a homeowners association, uh, allow parking a small van like the Revel or similar in size? Well, I've lived in several HOAs in my life, uh, and the only way, so if you have CCNRs or, or other restrictions that say that you can't have an RV parked in your HOA, then it really is, it depends on how much your HOA uh, enforces that. So for instance, I lived in an HOA where we did have restrictions on RVs. They weren't allowed to be parked anywhere visible in your driveway or, or on the street. Um, but I did have, at that time, I had a 23-foot Road Trek CS Adventurous, and I did park mine in the driveway and on the street. Um, and my HOA didn't really squawk about it. No one really made a, <clears throat> a fuss about it. That's not the case in every HOA. I think there's a YouTuber, Smedsters, who has an Airstream Interstate, and he lives in an HOA, and I believe they did squawk about it. He had to eventually move his Airstream Interstate out, you know, miles away to a, a parking place where he could park it. So it just depends on your HOA. The only thing that you can do I mean, the HOA is legal. I mean, it depends on your bylaws and your CCNRs, but you're legally bound and they can levy penalties and fines. And at least in the HOAs I've been in, they can actually, if you don't pay those fines, they can put a lien against your house. So you don't want to just ignore them. So the only way I know of is to actually work with the board and work with the homeowners and try to make your case that, look, the HOA should allow these smaller class B vans make an exception for them is maybe it's not, maybe put restrictions on larger ones or ones that are over a certain height or over a certain length, put restrictions on those, but allow ones that like class B's that are shorter and not as tall to be able to you know, have exceptions in the HOA. That's the only way I know how to do it. But every HOA is gonna be different. 
um, it, you know, get involved, get involved with your homeowners association, maybe run for the board um, like I did, and that gives you a lot more influence on the board and the ability to, to make effect changes like that. All right, our next question comes from Magic Journey, and this has been upvoted seven times as well. Magic Journey asks, why do companies, RV manufacturers, insist on giving you a weak one-year warranty on an expensive purchase like an RV? Well, uh, the only reason is for cost, Magic Journey. That, that's, that's the reason. Um, look at it this way. This is the th I'm, not, I'm not espousing this, but this is, I believe, the way some man RV manufacturers think. When you, when you buy an RV, like it's a camper van or a travel trailer or something like that, um, the general use case is gonna be, you're gonna use it the first, you know, you're gonna use it a few weeks, maybe a month or so out of the year. It doesn't make a lot of sense necessarily for them to offer a long warranty when it's just not necessarily being used a lot. So they build the RV to the quality level that they think it's going to be used at. So it's not like a, you're living out of it full time or anything like that, right? And then correspondingly, they offer a warranty that kind of matches that. And in doing so, the benefit to you as a consumer is you save money because to offer a longer warranty has a cascading effect, okay? Why? In order, if I'm an RV manufacturer, to offer you a longer warranty, I have to do uh, either one of two things. I either have to build a higher quality rig, which has costs associated with it, because I've got to do the things, like I can't use stick framing and staples. Um, it's just, I've got to custom build the cabinets. Uh, I got to use more solid woods. Um, I got to, you know, I've got to change my manufacturing technique. So all that adds cost in the manufacturing time, so, you know, and so you're going to pay for that. So they have to raise the price of the RV. So they either do it that way, right? And then for those of you who are cost sensitive buyers, uh, that's going to be a turnoff to you, all right? You're not, you're, that, you're not going to want to pay more money, right? And they know that, right? So, so they, they're trying to keep the cost down. That's one. Or what they do is they keep their costs down by not necessarily building to a higher quality and they have to on their books they have to increase their costs by saying well it's going to either be brought in more often right and we're going to have to cover that cost uh somewhere on the books right and that's going to be passed on to you again so that's going to drive the cost up they're not going to just eat that so they're going to pass that cost on to you or maybe what they could do is they could they could uh, buy a third-party extended warranty or something like that which you don't know about but they're going to also put that cost on the book three you know two thousand dollars or so i don't know what it is if they buy it in bulk and then it, then they're not going to worry about it they're going to wipe their hands clean and say okay well that's the warranty company it's paid for they'll take care of it in all cases the cost is going to be passed on to you as the consumer so why don't they they give you a one-year warranty because they're trying to not pass the cost on to you they're trying to keep the cost down these things are, are to your point they're already expensive 70 80 thousand 90 100, 100 you know they go up to two hundred thousand dollars class b vans so they're already expensive they're cognizant of that and they don't want to drive the cost up anymore some companies offer longer warranties and guess what those companies are the, the premium companies where you're paying uh, more money for them so i always call out the one-year warranty i i happen to think i think today this is just me i'll probably get a lot of flack for this from the manufacturers i think personally you can build a coach to a quality level and offer a three-year warranty at the price points that we're talking about i do i i just i think that that's should become an industry standard I know I'm, I know I'm going to get hate <laughs> from the manufacturers from that, but I don't know. For me, that just seems to be the sweet spot. I don't expect all manufacturers to have five-year warranties, you know, six-year warranties like that. I think that's an exception. I think it's great the company, some manufacturers do offer that, but you're paying premium for that. But I do think something more than a one-year warranty is in, is in order. I think manufacturers can offer that and I think they can build it to that level and I think they can do it in a way that's cost effective. So that's my opinion about the one-year warranty. All right, Jack J, been upvoted five times, says, what are your thoughts on the Ford Transit and also the Pleasure Way Tour 2.2 versus the Coachman Beyond 22C? All right, so I gave you my thoughts on the Ford Transit. I think the, it's always great when we have another chassis available here in North America. Um, and I think the Ford Transit's a great chassis. One of the I, I, things I haven't touched on yet is Ford over all the other manufacturers has the largest service center network, ProMaster, Ram ProMaster, and Mercedes. So 
that's something to consider. So if you ever have a problem with the chassis, you're going to more easily find a Ford service center than you are certainly than a Mercedes service center that can service the Sprinter. Um, so that's, that's one advantage of the Ford. The other thing is generally the cost associated when you do have to pay out of pocket for, for something uh, on, the tr on the chassis, the transit is going to be uh, a lot less expensive than on the Mercedes Sprinter. So I like the transit. Um, they offer it in a wide variety of different engine configurations, like diesel and turbo diesel and the EcoBoost and a, and, um, a gas engine. Uh, and now they're offering it in the all-wheel drive. So I think a lot of nice uh, options available on the chassis. And I'm glad to see manufacturers starting to adopt it. What I think of the Ontour 2.2, remember the Ontour 2.1? is basically a replica of the Ascent. That's the 19 foot model. The 2.2 is the Plateau. That's the 22 foot model. I like it. I mean, I think the, 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 the Plateau is a excellent layout. It's one of the top sellers for Pleasure Way. And so to offer it on a uh, Ford Transit, which is gonna be a little less expensive, um, I, think that's, I think that's great. Uh, and uh, more options for us consumers, the better. How about the Ontour 2.2 versus the Coachman Beyond 22C? So what are my thoughts on the uh, Ontour 2.2 versus the Coachman Beyond 22C? So for those, that, so the Coachman Beyond has three different uh, floor plans. They're both the Ontour and the Beyond are built on the Ford Transit. So the 22C is the same layout as the Ontour, which is the rear sofa bed layout. Then there's the 22D which has twin beds in the back. And then there's a beyond, the brand new Beyond 22 RB. I think the RB stands for rear bath. And uh, so it has a bath, full length width bath on the very back, and then it has the two twin sofas. So we're talking about the C though, which is the rear sofa bed configuration. Uh, I like all the options available on the Beyond. They offer so many more options than Pleasure Way offers on the on tour. And so if you're the type of buyer, if you're a performance buyer where you like having the ability to outfit the rig the way you want it outfitted. So you want to have upgraded lithium system or you want to have a DC quiet air conditioner, the upgraded insulation, uh, or you want to have the winterized package, right? Just so many options that they offer on the beyond, then you should just go with the beyond. Okay. Um, if you're a quality buyer, like I am, where all the options don't matter, but quality, then you want to go with the Ontour because Pleasure Way offers a five-year warranty versus a one-year warranty on the Beyond. The build quality is just so much higher on the uh, Ontour compared to the Beyond. So if you're a quality buyer, I would go with the Ontour. If you're a price-conscious buyer, you're going to go with the Beyond because uh, it's going to be, I think, you're going to get a much better discount on the Beyond than on the Ontour. So that's my thoughts on the difference between the Pleasure Way Ontour uh, versus the Coachman Beyond. And by the way, I can't wait to review the new RB because I think it's kind of an exciting layout with the full width bath in the back. So as soon as I see one of those on a dealer lot, I'll be reviewing it for you all. All right, that wraps it up. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you found this video a little bit valuable. I'll see you all again next time. Take care. Bye-bye.